Man, children are dismissed. half expecting Dawn or John to jump up and try to get out of here. <laughs> Not that you're characters and then Bud would be right behind you so it's like what can you do huh? What can you do? <laughs> Today's Palm Sunday as we've already expressed and you all have your your palm leaves and as you know uh, the story that uh, is found in or I can't I hate to call it a story because when you call something a story, it's kind of like you know, it might be made up or a fairy tale or something like that. So I will say, you all know the scripture of uh, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem where they took the palm branches and uh, cut them and uh, laid them on the, on the roadway and they waved them as Jesus was uh, riding on that colt into Jerusalem. Wow. Uh, this, these scriptures or this event is found in all four of the Gospels. So it is something that each one of the Gospel writers have uh, thought that was very important. And to us it is. To us it is. It is Jesus actually giving, up of, giving himself up going into Jerusalem. And it's just a week later that uh, he has risen from the tomb uh, with that. And with that, I would like to read this event uh, found in Matthew. Now, it won't be on the screen because I didn't get that to Jana. I added this a little bit later. But this is found, I'm, I'm going to read the one that is found in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, just to give us a reminder of, of what that scripture states. And then as we continue on in the message, we're going to leave this part of it. But we're going to look into what Paul's description of a triumphal entry was like for the Romans. And then we'll see how Paul ties that together with this triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their, spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went, went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will just add your blessing to the reading of this word and open our eyes and our ears to hear the truth that you have for us. Amen. The people that were 
with Jesus and celebrated his entry into Jerusalem wanted to make him their king. That was their thoughts all along. That is why they gathered together and, and, and did this for Jesus. Because this was a procession that they thought, well, Jesus is going to ride into Jerusalem. And he's going to continue going right up through the capital and right out in front of Pilate's, uh, the governor's mansion, the Pilate's mansion, whatever, where a Pilate was living, whatever it was. And they were going to go right up on the steps. And Jesus was going to overthrow the Roman government that was in charge at that time. But the thing is, Jesus didn't do that. They thought that he was going to do that. But where did Jesus go when he entered into Jerusalem? Where did he go? He went into the temple. And he cast out the money changers and those that were, were trading the temple coins for the you know, for the regular money, so to speak. And what I have studied on that aspect of why he did that. Why did he throw the money changers out? What was going on with all that? What was wrong with that? Well, what would happen was if you went into the temple and you wanted to buy that sacrificial lamb, your money was no good that you carried in your wallet to do business in the world or out in the, in the city of Jerusalem. That money was no good. So you had to exchange your common money for the temple money, which the exchange rate was very lopsided, very lopsided. So you would give them so much of, of your money, so many dollars to equal so much of the temple money. And then you would pay an ex a high price for this sacrificial lamb or dove or whatever it was. Well, then when you left the temple, you didn't need their money. You couldn't spend it anywhere else but there because it was sacred money. So when you went to exchange your money again to get back to the common dollar or whatever it was, the exchange rate also was not in your favor again. So these money changers, if you've ever wondered what was so wrong with that and what it was a den, what Jesus called a den of robbers, that they were stealing from the people in the name of, of uh, forgiveness and the name of the priests and all that. It was kind of a racket that they had going on, a kind of a racket. And that is why Jesus, that's the first place he went to try and clean up his father's house. This triumphal in entry is a major event in the final days of Jesus' ministry. This is a major thing taking place. All four Gospels have put, have put this out there. But this would have received very little attention by the Roman authorities. They wouldn't have paid much attention to Jesus coming in like this. They wouldn't have thought anything of it. Because there would have been so many people coming to Jerusalem from all around the world, wherever they were coming from, to make their sacrifices for the forgiveness of their sins, that sacrificial lamb. So people were just flocking to Jerusalem. So Jesus coming in on his donkey, on his colt, and the people saying Hosanna and shouting really didn't mean nothing to the Romans. They weren't, they weren't concerned because Jesus didn't go up to Pilate's doorstep and, and declare war on him. He made no speeches to overthrow the, the Roman government. He didn't go in and, and make demands of the Romans or anything. He didn't do anything. The only thing that was, there was no battle cry. The only battle cry that there was was Hosanna. And Hosanna is a prayer, save us. That was their battle cry. It was a battle cry to God to save them. And it wasn't Jesus' battle cry. Jesus came to save us, but not the way the people thought they were going to be saved. So the, the Romans, in all aspects of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the Romans had nothing to fear. There was nothing that they need to worry about, needed to worry about, because these people were coming in, they were coming into Jerusalem regardless. <clears throat> but the Romans knew 
exactly what a triumphal entry was or a triumphal parade. Uh, they knew what it looked like and what Christ was doing. This was no triumphal entry of any conqueror that they would have recognized. <clears throat> the Roman Empire was in power from 27 BC to 1453 AD. A total of 1,480 years. Now when I looked that up, when I saw that, it's like, what? 1,480 years. The United States doesn't even have 300 years in yet. We don't even have 300 years as a nation. Can you imagine 1,480 years of being in power? In that time, the Romans had approximately 350 triumphal victory parades. 350 triumphal victory parades. That's more parades than we have years as a nation. <clears throat> and they built a total of 36 triumphal arches. The most famous one is the one in France, the Arch of, of the Arch of Triumph, and it is huge. I guess uh, at one time a, a biplane, you know, the dual wing biplane was able to fly under that arch. And I believe when uh, Hitler went into France, he had some pictures taken at the Arch of Triumph. So, and this from France and many other nations had copied the Roman arches, the uh, Roman arches of triumph. So, but these, these arches and these parades, they all represent power and authority and how they were able to go in and conquer other nations and able to go in and conquer other peoples and take their possessions back with them or do whatever they wanted to do. So these, these parades represented power and authority. So Jesus' parade, triumphal entry, so to speak, as we call it as Christians, the Romans, it's like, what? <laughs> You're kidding me. That's all you got? <laughs> that would be what they'd say. That's all you got is a triumphal entry? Jesus' entry into Jerusalem represented peace, love, and humility. Not power and strength and possessions. It was peace, love, and humility. By riding a donkey colt, Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy found in the book of Zechariah 9, 9 through 10. And I'll read that for you. <clears throat> Rejoice, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, that's Israel. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. He will rule. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is telling of Jesus' coming and how he was going to come. And this prophecy was fulfilled. This prophecy has been fulfilled. Now Paul also speaks of a triumphal parade that comes through Jesus, that comes through what Jesus has done. We find that in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 17. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? 
Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. Now, this scripture is hard for us to understand. This is something that is like, okay, what, what is this? What's Paul talking about? What's he talking about the, in these scriptures? The smell of life and the smell of death, a stench in the nostrils of those that are dying. What's this all about? But we don't understand it, but the Jews and the people back in this day, back in the time of the Roman rule, seeing these triumphal entries, these 365 triumphal entries into the, in, back into Rome, when the armies came back into Rome, people would understand exactly, exactly what Paul is talking about here. But to us, this is strange. We don't understand that. We don't get what he's talking about. Paul, what Paul is doing is he is re describing a Roman triumph here. A glorious, uh, uh, an extravagant parade to honor a victorious general and his army as they come back to Rome. That's what these triumphs were. It was the conquering army, the, the leaders of that army, as they come back to Rome, they build an arch for them that they would march under this arch where they would have this victory parade going on at this time whenever the, the conquering armies would come back. <clears throat> but the thing was, it was the way these processions went. It was the way this parade was carried out is where Paul is getting this. First, there was leading the way uh, of this victory parade were the senators and the officials of Rome. The senators and officials of Rome. Sounds kind of like our government today. If there's, if there's a parade, they want to be right out front. They want to be the ones that are seen like, oh, it was all my idea. You know, unless you lose and then they don't want to be around. They won't show their face. But the senators and those leaders in the Roman government, they were leading the procession. They were leading this parade. They were the first ones to march and go under the, the new arch if there was an arch of triumph that was... Uh, that was built for this uh, victory, celebrated victory, or whatever it was. They were the first ones. Then came the trumpeteers, blasting their horns, signaling the return of the conquering army. The trumpeteers were the ones, the senators were first, you know, they were, they were kissing babies and shaking hands and, and they were running for office and, and you know, and, and promising all these things. And then next comes the trumpeteers, the band. You know, playing the drums or whatever. They're leading the way. That's getting everybody's attention. You know, whatever city in Rome when they were coming through and there you hear the band and you, you see the commotion or know the commotion's there, so you go running. The trumpeteers, they announced it. They were announcing the coming of this procession and this parade. Behind them were carried the treasures taken from the conquered nation. They would have people that were carrying the gold and the silver and all the, uh, it might have even been some timber or, or clothing, spices, whatever it was, whatever they had conquered, it was of any value, they carried that next behind, behind the trumpeters. And, uh, and the servants were carrying, they carried pictures and murals and, and models of enemy fortresses, enemy cities and, and enemy ships that had either been captured or destroyed. So it kind of be like a Macy's Day parade where they had the floats going through, you know? This is, this is a city that we captured and we own this city, a likeness of it, a resemblance of it. And then whatever ships or whatever it was that they, that they destroyed or they, they, they captured, they were, they were bringing them on in models of what it was. Bringing that up next, what they had captured or they had destroyed. Then came, then came slaves spreading fragrant flowers and pagan priests, the Roman pagan priests, swinging their censers filled with incense. Uh, 
and all around these generals, you know, they would be leading the way and then the generals would be coming next. So you have these flowers that, that are putting off an aroma and then you have these censers full of incense that they're swinging back and forth. And pro I don't know how many pagan priests there would be, but it would be enough to fill the air with these incense and these fragrances from these censers and from these flowers. And it would be surrounding these generals as they walked in. So with this parade, not only do you have the band, the trumpeter, the trumpeters uh, announcing the way, and you have that noise and commotion, and you have the sight of seeing all these, these models and these floats, so to speak, but you also have the aroma coming from one of their parades. The only thing I can think of, maybe the Rose Parade that we, that we hold, uh, you might get a, I don't know, I've never been to one. But if you have that many roses on float, surely you're going to get a smell of something. Of course, nowadays roses, some roses don't even smell, so who knows? But you know, so this was a parade that was not only sight and sound, but it was also the scent of smell. So this is where we're getting with what Paul was saying, the scent of death, the scent of life is coming from these, these victory parades. <clears throat> Behind the generals' chariots were the captives. They were bound. Perhaps they were tied to the generals' chariots or tied to wagons. Whatever it was, they were being drugged. They were being, they were being pulled along behind the generals. The captives. The captives were there. And some of the some of them were probably even in cages, put in cages. You've seen some of that on TV, I'm sure with the Roman uh, movies that are out there. We've all seen this likeness of them being in cages as they're bound and they're being drugged behind the chariot. So this would be the scene. This would be what would be happening. And these would be the people that were conquered. The people that were conquered were brought in behind everything. Some of them would have their lives spared. Um, they would be slaves to Rome. They would be put into the armies or into the service of the government. There would be something that they would be used for in, in this aspect of being conquered. Then there would be others that would be sold into slavery. They would have been taken to an auction block and sold into slavery to help to pay for the war. You know, because war isn't cheap. And so they would, the army would not be cheap. So they would sell these, the, these people into slavery to help to, uh, to bolster up the, the army or to, for whatever it would be used for in the government. But many others, <clears throat> including the nobility, the kings, and the fiercest warriors at the end of the parade, after the procession was all over and the senators and governors all went and had their feast or whatever it was and the generals went back to their army the nobles and the fiercest warriors would be led out somewhere and they would be executed they'd be beheaded they'd be crucified uh, maybe put into the Colosseum whatever it was but these people were destined to die so what Paul is getting at here is that the festivities of the parade and the smell of the flowers and the incense to those sentenced to death was a stench in their nostrils. They would have been, be been drugged behind the generals and the incense and flowers would have been in front of them. So this flow of this smell of incense would have been right with them as they were continuing to march. And those that would, knew they were marching to their death, they would smell this and that sense would be in their nostrils. And Paul saying what was, is happening to them, it is a stench to their death. <clears throat> but to those captives that were going to be spared, even if they were sold into slavery, they were going to be spared their lives. They were a conquered nation. They were a conquered people. And they were still going to be able to live. Maybe not freely, but they were going to be given their life. This scent and this smell from these, the flowers and from these sensors and the, the <clears throat> going up was a scent of life to them. Can you imagine that? I remember... <clears throat> <clears throat> I remember when I gave my life to the Lord some 40 years ago. 
And I've told this story like I was hanging on to the pew for dear life, you know. I think my fingerprints are still in the pew at Kellersburg where I was holding on. It's like I didn't want to go forward. I was arguing and fighting with the Holy Spirit. I finally went forward and gave my life to the Lord. And you know that next morning when I got out of bed and I went outside, I opened up the door. It's like, whoa, what a beautiful day. And many of you have said to me when we come in today, it might be cold out. But it's a beautiful day. I'm wrong. It's a beautiful day. Amen. I had, I had a sense. Now this wasn't just something that went through my mind. But this was a realization that I had. When I opened that door. It's like the air was fresher. I was like what? <laughs> the sky was clearer. Like I had never seen it before. Honestly, this, is, this isn't just something I'm saying. This is something I noticed after I had given my life to the Lord. It's like, wow, it was changed. My whole perceptive, my whole thinking, my whole my looking at what was around me, my perception was changed. The air was clearer. The air was fresher. The sky was clearer. The sky was bluer. <clears throat> God gives us that when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He puts, a, he puts a newness in us. We're a new person. Paul was using these few verses in Scripture today to bring us to an eternal understanding. Through the Scripture, through what he has said, the descent of, these, of this procession, of this triumphal entry of the Romans is also what Jesus is representing to us. You see that Jesus is the conquering general. Right? We, we're celebrating that. He's the conqueror. He's the one that has defeated Satan. On the cross, his blood paid for our sins, the price for our sins. Through him, we have forgiveness. Through him, we have life. Through him, through the empty tomb, the tomb, we are promised life everlasting with him and his kingdom. And in his victory parade, we are the ones that are following behind the general. Jesus is the conqueror. He's riding in that chariot. And all of us are the ones, we're the spoils of that victory, right? We're the spoils of that victory. We're what he has won. Each and every one of us. We are what Jesus has won. He has won the battle against Satan for us. He died on that cross. Why? Not for money. Not for recognition. He died on that cross for us. So we are the spoils of his victory. We are the ones coming behind the general. And as we look at that, those of us, those that have surrendered unto Jesus, those that have surrendered their lives to Jesus, walk in the sweet aroma of life. Walk in that sweet aroma of life. It may not be. It may not be things that happen in this life. It may be. It may. We may have a tough time. Things may be hard, and life is hard. It doesn't matter. But we are promised through the scriptures that we will have life eternal in Jesus Christ. That's what He gives us, and we have that sweet scent. That sweet scent that Paul is saying unto life. But yet there are those that have not surrendered. They're still conquered, but they don't realize it. They are still captive, but they don't realize it. But they don't want to surrender. They want to hang on to what they have. They want, they want to continue on in their life of sin. They want to continue to hang on to their lifestyle, so to speak. And they are, they are bound, and they don't realize they are bound. They are bound to sin. And they are, being, they are still coming behind Jesus in His chariot. They're still coming behind, but they don't want to give it up. To them, they're fighting against the Holy Spirit, rejecting the sweet smell of salvation. And they are doomed to death. We all are destined to die one time. And those that believe in Jesus Christ will continue to live. Will only die once. But those that have not received Jesus Christ. A second death. A physical death. And a spiritual death. When they are cast into the pits of hell. 
<clears throat> Romans 8, 12 through 17. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is, it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if you, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. Notice that? We haven't received the spirit that, puts, that makes us a slave to fear. But you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory Paul is telling us in these promises that if we continue if we we follow Jesus Christ we won't resent we will have the the scent of life if we reject Jesus Christ, it'll be a displeasure to our nostrils, a stench to our nostrils. As I read this and studied this, I found it very fascinating how Paul tied the two together of what these victory parades actually mean to us as Christians. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, for the promises you have given us. Uh, Lord, that... Uh, that we can take these words with us, Lord, and we can follow you in life, knowing that Jesus is the victor and he's leading the parade. And we follow along, Father God, given life, not headed out to be executed, not headed out to the second death, but through Jesus Christ, he has promised us life and the wonderful scent of that life in our nostrils. So we thank you, Father, for that. And we pray these things in the precious, precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. At this time today, we're also going to have communion. Uh, <clears throat> with that, I'd like to read. I'd like to read a little bit before we, before we have the communion. Um, this is the Last Supper found in Luke chapter 22, verse starting at verse 7. Then came the day of the unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want to prepare, prepare it? they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asked, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes.
body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the, what Jesus has done at this, uh, this last supper. He took his disciples in and washed their feet and, and set them around the table and broke bread. This is my body broken for you. And we understand that. That this is the word, the truth of the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. And we thank you for that, Father, for your word and the truth of it. And through Jesus Christ, Father God, we can understand that truth. Lord, be with us and build with us. We pray this thing in Jesus' name. Amen.
given us in our lives because we have turned 